So I want to ground us in a little work from Sexuality and the Sacred, um, edited by James Nelson and Sandra P. Longfellow. First, sexuality is a far more comprehensive matter, broader, richer, and more fundamental to our human existence than simply genital sex. And second, our sexuality is intended by the divine to be neither incidental nor detrimental to our spirituality, but rather a fully integrated and basic dimension of spirituality. It is who we are as body selves, selves who experience the ambiguities of both having and being bodies. Sexuality embraces our ways of being in the world as persons embodied with biological femaleness or maleness or intersex realities with internalized understandings of what these genders mean. Sexuality includes our erotic orientations, our attractions to the other sex, to the same sex, or to both, or the reality of no attraction to sex at all. Sexuality encourages the range of feelings, interpretations, and behaviors through which we express our capacity for sensuous relationships with others with ourselves and with the world. While sexuality is always rooted in our body realities, it is much larger than these, always involving our minds, our feelings, our wills, our memories, indeed our self-understanding and powers as embodied persons. So sexuality, as we will talk about it tonight, is both an embodied and a disembodied reality, right? It has to do as much with what happens with our genitals as with what happens with our brains and our minds and our hearts and our emotions. Um, and it can't really be reduced to um, bedroom or kitchen counter behavior right because sexuality is a part of who we are holistically it's a part of our way of being in the world when we talk about people's sexuality we're not talking about some physical reality apart from who they are it's not just what you do right um, we talk about sexuality we talk about who you are in the world who you want to be in the world, who you enjoy in the world, who you want to be with in the world. And so to talk about someone's sexuality is to talk very much about the core of who they are. Um, it's very much to talk about their identity as a human um, and the full range of their human experience. In order to do that, I'd like to talk through some terminology that we hear a lot of and may have... Um, questions about or and or um, may have very divergent thinking around what these terms mean. Um, and so I'll start with one that's pretty pretty old and that's gender. Right? What is gender? When we talk about gender, what is gender? Gender is a socially constructed identity. Most often assumed to be determined by one's biology, right? But gender as a socially constructed reality is a fairly new conversation in the broad marketplace. We assumed that everyone born with a penis is male and everyone born with a vagina is female. And then culturally, there were huge sets of assumptions around what that meant. So when a child's um, biological reality was determined pre-birth, we went out and we rushed out and we bought what? All oh, what color clothes? Blue clothes if it was a boy and pink if it was a girl and if it was a boy we bought basketballs and we bought footballs and trucks and if it was a girl we bought dolls and we bought um, stuffed animals and and we did all of these things because we assumed that a biological reality would transform or transmit 
into a gendered reality when in fact what we're doing is gendering the child right we're giving the child what we expect them to behave like because as a socially constructed reality gender is performative gender is how one performs one's way of being in the world so that brings us to another term gender conformity which is having traits and identities that adhere to gender role expectations. You say, well, how are gender roles, role expectations even set so that we can begin to talk about gender conformity? Well, we have a little saying in um, American culture, girls are sugar and, and everything, and boys are snakes and, and puppy dog tails. Now, what does that mean? What does that communicate to us about the expectation of girls versus the expectation of boys, right? That's how gender conforming starts. We say to little girls, you know, don't jump off of that. That's not very ladylike. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> I seem to have stepped into something and rolled my ankle, but I digress. <laughs> I digress. Um, and we say, and we say to little boys, "Hey, man up, right? Act like a man." As as if masculinity is something that is put on. It's because deep in our subconscious, we know that these roles are performative. Little boys don't do that. Little boys don't cry like that. Little boys don't hold their arms like that. Little boys don't sit like that. Little girls don't gap their legs like that. Little, right? We have all of these, these ideas um, for little people in the world that help them conform to what we consider to be gender norms. Now, gender conformity is different than gender identity. Because gender identity is a person's sense of identification as male or female, or both male and female, or a third gender, right? That's gender identity. That's how do I identify uh, with performance in the world? That's my gender identity, right? Do I, do I identify with performing as male? Do I identify with performing as female? Do I identify with, there are some things that are outside of my experience, but even though I haven't experienced it, uh, maybe I identify with it. That's gender identity. Gender non-conforming, I'm using this paper because I, there's things that I want to lift up in this space and I don't want to forget. Gender non-conformity is having traits and identities that do not adhere to gender role expectations, right? So gender non-conformity looks like anything from a little girl who wishes to play football or a little boy who wishes to wear a dress all the way through to a, a little boy who's more or, or a grown man who is more emotive and a uh, adult woman who is um, more authoritative right in some way or shape one some way shape or form that individual is gender non-conforming because in our places of work uh, if if a if a woman um, says to an employee, you were late, and that's unacceptable. We will dock your pay. What do they call her behind her back? That's probably what they call her. And if a man says to an employee, you were late, that's unacceptable, and we will dock your pay. What do they call that man? A boss. A leader. Right? Because there are certain gender expectations, right? Now, if that male boss comes and sits down and says to his employee, I noticed you were late today, and I'm just really concerned that you don't feel well. Is everything all right? Are you good? You know, is there anything we can do for you? I can't imagine why you would be late. What do we say of that man? Feminine gay sissy weak 
But if a woman comes to an employee and says, hey, I noticed you were late. Is there anything we can do for you? Um, is everything all right at home? Are the kids good? What do we say of that woman? She's compassionate. She's sympathetic. She's sensitive. She's a great boss. Right? Because our idea of the way women should lead and the way men should lead are different. And anytime you don't um, play into that, to those um, typecasts, um, that is really gender nonconforming. Different from gender presentation, which is the gender others perceive and assign to an individual based on dress, looks, and action. Mm, now that's different because gender presentation is about perception as much as it is about intention. I can remember I was about maybe 13 years old and when I was 13 year old um, all the black people in the world had jerry curls you know, because they wanted that you remember Michael Jackson and the Pepsi Cola thing they wanted hair that like looked like Michael Jackson and the Pepsi Cola and there was there was this person whose name I won't call because we're videotaping um, and he, he was a large man and quite well known in the community and he had one and he had on a big mink coat and we were in a dark theater and I bumped into him from the back and I looked up and saw long hair and a mink coat and said excuse me ma'am and he turned around with his full beard and said do I look like a ma'am to you and my innocent 13 year old said, said from behind <laughs> I mean, it was just a sincere answer yep pretty much <laughs> I saw long hair and a fur coat eh, it could eh. yeah you did right but that is gender presentation like how are you perceived in the world as you go out into the world what do other people assigned to you which goes to gender role expectations and gender variance, which is a behavior, style of dress, action, or identity that does not adhere to the standard ideas of what it means to be a man or a woman, right? So the last gender thing I want to lift up is gender queer which is a self descriptor for people whose internal sense and external expression of gender transgresses or challenges or moves beyond characterizations such as male and female and who live against culturally assigned norms of the male female gender binary. So I have a member of, of, of our local congregation who likes to queer gender. He's, he's gender queer. Um, his pronouns are he and him but they are also them and they and on any given moment he might have on a sweatsuit and a Louis Vuitton purse because if he's going to be queering gender he's going to do it at a pretty high price tag it's just kind of how he is um, and if, if there's a room full of people and there's furniture that needs, needs to be moved he might say of himself Oh, he doesn't do manual labor. Like, just because I'm big and male, don't ask me to move things. Like, you don't see all these women here? They're able-bodied. I'm good. Because he's always pushing back against those very specific gender role assignments. Um, hopefully, we've created a space um, where that's okay to name for himself. Um, and I'll have to ask him. <laughs> Um, but I think so. I think so. So those are kind of the, the gender conversations or an entry point into how we consider gender. And how we talk about sexuality is very connected to how we understand gender and how we understand gender roles, right? Because um, the common thought at one point um, in American culture was that men were to be the aggressors. And because men were to be the aggressors, they also were to be um, sexual initiators because that's like 
to roll. And women were supposed to feign like they didn't really enjoy sex. And that wasn't supposed to be the goal because it wasn't ladylike and it wasn't demure. So somebody wrote that book, The Joy of Sex, and like everybody figured out that women can have orgasms. And then that kind of went out the window. Yeah, that didn't work. But it also served a very important function that I think we overlook. And that is that early in the history of America, um, because of our health care system, um, women without contraceptives were dying in childbirth at alarming rates. And some of this idea that women weren't supposed to like sex was also a self-preservation methodology that women passed down to other women because the, every child you had increased your risk of dying in childbirth. And women were having children 12 months apart three and four times they spent most of their adult life pregnant many of those children did not make it so that there was that psychological damage as well as the physical damage on the body so some of these gender role um, plays have a lot to do with the way in which a culture preserves itself and we want to put it all on misogyny and patriarchy and but it was also a survival mechanism that women pass to other women to say this is how you know this is how you preserve yourself and you have to do it by rejecting physical intimacy that could lead to endangering you and the life of your children so i also want to lift up the end the ways in which we talk about gender. And um, for some people, I mean, probably not here at Genesis, but for some people there's a relatively new term, and that is cisgender. And a cisgender individual is one who experiences his or her own gender as matching the sex assigned as birth, at birth. That's a cisgender person. Did I not explain that well? If you identify as what your gender was assigned to you on your birth certificate where it says male or female, and the whole rest of your life you say, yes, I am male, yes, I am female, you are a cisgendered individual. Why the term? I'm glad you asked. Particularly as we recraft language around transgendered, it is to say I am not presumptive that your entire experience has been this. So a transgendered person, I'm going to say this so correctly, because we're filming, and I have friends with whom I will get in trouble if I say the wrong thing. And I want to stay out of trouble. A transgender person is an umbrella term used to describe any individual who does not identify with the sex assigned them at birth and or who feels such a gendered assignment is incorrect or incomplete. Transgender persons who, who choose to undergo a gender reassignment process, though importantly not all, may be described in literature as MTF, or male to female, or FTM, female to male, or alternatively trans woman and trans man, respectively. So this is important conversation because we'll say, would all the women stand to the right and all the men stand to the left? And a trans man will go to the left with cisgendered males and we'll be having a conversation about what does it mean to be a man? But that trans man's experience as a man and their journey to express as a man is different than someone who was born in a male body who journeys toward male adulthood. So it's important to identify this is a trans man, this is a cisgendered man, these are men. Because there's commonality in the fact that they are men and there's specificity in the fact that they have or have not always had the same assignment. So a trans woman who is identified as woman um, 
a cisgendered woman rather has never experienced life through the lens of male privilege a trans woman at one point has also had male privilege and will speak to male privilege from a very different space than a trans a cisgendered woman right who will speak to male privilege from the place of a trans woman did not have a boyhood so there are lots of conversations there's lots of experience wrapped up in trans identity and we have to acknowledge and know that there's lots of conversation and lots of experience wrapped up in cis identity and so even the way we talk about being a man or being a woman when we're cisgendered is is very presumptive of a lot of things so as the language changed around trans in order for us to have beloved community or open up the table wider for everybody to be at the table the language around cis had to change as well or the language around the experience of being male or female from birth forward has to change as well that's a very good question thank you for thank you for asking <laughs> 